Everything is cheesy. The plot is stupid. I'm sorry, the plot is bad. That's a little opening. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a magical edition Ooh. of ARG Percent. Sort of a Doug Hitting sort of magic. I'm your good buddy, your good pal, Amigo Aaron. Joined by a man who's magical in his own right. I give you the Brent. I don't know who Doug Henning is. You don't know who Doug Henning is, the famous 70s magician? Look him up. Everyone look him up. Why are we talking about magic today, aside from the usual natural magic that we <laughs> are viewed with? It's because we, I think we call that a curse, Aaron. That's right. We, we spun the wheel, and we made the exciting deal. Excited on this one, the Brent. We'll be looking at the Exidy Sorcerer. The Sorcerer, Brent. Now, yes. You know... A couple years ago, our good buddy John Bodokar Chawler was over in uh, Ireland, yep. right? Sort of an interview with an, an Amiga uh, luminary, right? And the guy mentioned, he says, listen, my very, the very first computer I ever learned to program on was the Exidy Sorcerer. And when he said this, I was like, Exidy Sorcerer? Like the arcade manufacturers? Like, I didn't know what it was, right? Now... I am imbued with, I'm magically imbued with all the knowledge and power it takes to understand what it is. Would you like me to imbue you with this magic? No, not at all. Well, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Okay. So, the Exe Sorcerer, now this is an interesting tale, okay? <clears throat> We've got a machine here that came out in 78, okay? And uh, this thing was produced in the tens of thousands, according to Wiki. We don't have exact there, so they made more than a few, Okay. And this was started here in the USA and went worldwide. But the idea of the Exidy Sorcerer was to, was to combine all the great, the great points of the computers that were out at the time into one supercomputer. It was like one of those bands like the Traveling Wilburys, where you get like all the big stars together for one ultra band. Right. That's what the Exidy Sorcerer was. Um, there was a guy named Paul Terrell. He was in the computer industry. He was a guy who started a big personal computer store. He was doing well. It was called the Byte Shop. And, and it made it in 75. Yeah, it's spelled cool guy style. Well, I'm so sure it's in 77, computer style. In 77, this guy had 58 stores. And he sold the chain to another guy. He's like, okay, now I'm ready to get into something. And this was his entry. He's like, I'm going to make this computer. So he looked at the Apple II, the, the TRS-80, and the PET. And he's like, these are the computers I will base my new Ultra computer on, right? <laughs> and so when he was he was designing this computer, and he thought to himself, what do you name this computer? And this is a quote from Paul. He said, or uh, from uh, Paul Trey, he said, computers are, are like magic to people. So let's give them computer magic with the sorcerer computer. Isn't that nice? Not really, but I... <laughs> <laughs> that's cheesy as all get out. Isn't it? I mean, that's cheesy, isn't it? Well, it's, it is. Okay. So get this, though. So you're thinking, so, okay, there's a guy, he's going to make the computer big whoop. But how does Exidy fit into the picture? Now, who knows what Exidy is? Well, I do. What I do. What is it, Brent? They're an arcade designer. Correct. Manufacturer, producer. They were Exidy Incorporated, founded in uh, 1973. And the founders were Pete Kaufman and Samuel Hawes, right? And they were in Palo Alto, California. They made arcade games. Now, they made a zillion arcade games, but I'm going to hit some of the high points just so people remind what they were. And tell me if you heard of these, the Brent. Yeah. In 75, they cranked out Death Race. Oh, absolutely. Uh, in 77, Circus, which mm -hmm. was a very yes. famous one. Yeah. 77, they also did Starfire, or 79, did Starfire, 80, Targ. Maybe Targ is the one we were trying it to think is. of. Uh, in uh, 81, Mousetrap, this is when they hit their stride. In 81, they did Mousetrap, Venture. In 82, Pepper 2. And in 83, Crossbow. Probably, what would you say the, of these so far was their biggest hit? Crossbow, without a question. Venture and Crossbow, I'd say were at the top of the heap. Yeah. And then they finished up with Cheyenne and the uh, Disturbing Chiller in 86. And then they sort, of, they sort of went into another field at that point. So anyway, Exidy was a, a real uh, player back in the day. So anyway, it turns out that Terrell knew he was buddies with uh, Pete Kaufman and, and Howard Ivey of Exidy. He's like, listen, you guys need to get in the computer business. And they were like, what the heck? Okay, we'll do it. And they did. <laughs> and, they did. and so he, their plan was simple. 
They wanted a, the powerful machine. It was an all-in-one machine, right? But it had a, it didn't really have internal expansion, so they were going to have like an expansion unit, and they did. Yeah, well, they had a port that led to an expansion right. that you could put an expansion unit on. Yeah, y yeah. So this was the S one hundred expansion bus. Now let's get to the particulars of the computer here. Now, you, Aaron, do you know why they did that? Why did they do it, the brand? Because they saw mainframes at the time, uh -huh. and they're like, yeah, we want to be able to give people the option to do that. Oh, you looked into this, didn't you, the brand? Good for you. So, uh, again, this machine came out in 78. Uh, really, they designed it in 77. And this thing had, they, they had uh, several different units, but the base units uh, were eight. You had your 8K RAM, your 16K, and your 32K. Now, the 8K, 900 bucks US at the time. And that's $4,200 of some change in today's money. All right. Uh, the uh, 16K was eleven fifty, and the uh, the big dog, 32K, $1,395. That's big memory back in those days. Oh, yeah. Uh, this system came out. You had the Sorcerer 1 and the Sorcerer 2. And these things had uh, various, uh, they had various configurations and upgrades. And so, this thing ran on the old Zilog Z80, clocked at 2.1 megahertz. Not bad. This thing had an interesting setup. The display on this could go 512 by 240 and 64 by 30. And they what they used for graphics were like character graphics. It was a mixed bag. Well, it, they did more than just character graphics, though. They wanted to give the people, the programmers, the ability to make more than character graphics. Right. Because there was a whole thing with that. In the very early computers, where you had, uh, you know, like the alternate press on all the keyboards that could make characters, yeah. uh, he saw that, and he was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to limit people to just those symbols to make things. So they, he had the capability uh, to make actual sprite symbol things. They weren't sprites. Well, no, they were characters. They were gra very primitive graphics on a right. low res. Yeah. Now, the funny thing is... Uh, if you look at a keyboard for one of these, yeah. they also have the alternate key little character, like half circle type stuff too. Yeah. Even though he poo pooed it when they were first starting to make these, he, he came around. Uh, what this meant was uh, that this thing had, had some versatility. Now it did not have uh, any sort of audio with a butt, and we'll get to the butt in a, in a little bit. Actually, it's more with with the exception of a. <laughs> yeah, uh, the uh, uh, this thing you could store. Now get this. So this thing had a built-in cartridge slot, and the card. This is the best part, everybody. The cartridges on this thing used the shell of an eight-track tape <laughs> that they doctored up, and not well. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's not a it's not a tape in there. It's cartridge. Yeah. They, that's pretty clever. And when you see a cartridge put into this thing, it looks like you're. It looks like you're to kill the computer. It's just it's huge. This huge thing going in there, but it's still that's still cool. A few things about that, Aaron. Yeah. Not only did they use eight tracks, right? Yeah. But they didn't like get specially manufactured eight tracks. They bought eight tracks basically off the shelf <laughs> and then hollowed them out with like tools. Like if you look at a, an old cartridge uh, from the sorcerer, you can see visible cut marks. Around the PCB where you put it in, where the PCB is inside. Another thing that's very uh, unusual about this is the cartridges, they plug into the side, but they don't just plug into the side. No. It's like, like a 45 degree yeah, angle. Yeah, it's, like you're, it's like you're really driving the cartridge into the and, machine. And really, a lot of it doesn't hang out. I mean, it goes in there pretty good. Oh, it good. goes pretty good. Yeah. So, And there's a reason for that. These machines are massive. Yeah, they're big. They're good size machines. And keep in mind, these things have a full, full action keyboard on them. No, they're not. They're not. They're the top shelf keyboard plus number pad. Yeah, it's the double. It's the double. You can see why Doug Haney uh, picked this to program one, at least from a keyboard perspective, because <laughs> you will have some uh, good keyboard action. This thing had a built-in power supply too. Yeah. So it was. Which like, is which is why the eight tracks had so much room to go inside the machine. This thing also had peripherals you could get. You could use a tape uh, or tape recorder. You could have a floppy drive. You could also, have, you, of course, we mentioned the S one hundred bus expansion. They're big, big bus thing. Uh, it also 
Uh, if you played your cards right, you could get a sound card. And uh, well, that's not true. You could get a sound gimmick that hooked in the parallel <laughs> board. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to my game. So here they are. Here comes Exidy, and they're like, "Okay, we've got it. Uh, we've got our computer." And also, this thing came with Microsoft Basic on a cartridge that was included in every unit. So here's the funny thing about this because it could use Basic CPM as well. You, it's all since you had that big cartridge, it allows you just to change the OS on the cartridge. Yeah. So you, whatever you want on the fly. Yeah. So when you boot it up with no cartridge or nothing, it would just come up with like uh, with you could do basic stuff in it. But you yeah, could do it, like it wasn't basic, but you could do like load command. Right. It had its own OS, but really, it, it mostly used the basic to do all of its. Yeah. If you wanted to do stuff with the computer. So here's what here was the problem. Now, the problem was Exidy wasn't really into the computer business that much. No. And also, it didn't do well. <laughs> that was also a problem. But in some places, it did better than you'd think. Uh, for example, for, uh, due to a bunch of wacky circumstances, this thing was a pretty big seller in the Netherlands. And once again, it's another computer that did better everywhere but America. It didn't do, it did, I mean, when I say better, don't get me wrong, it wasn't killing it, but it was doing well. Uh, and so it got distributed by uh, a few other people, foreign countries from here. And one of them, our old buddy, I couldn't find my shirt to wear it today, but Dick Smith also yeah. sold this. And so this had a following in Australia. Pretty cool. Dick Smith got his hands in all sorts of pies. He was in. He was into everything. So eventually, unfortunately, this thing tipped over. The uh, uh, it basically in uh, exit. He stopped producing the machine in eighty. So keep in mind, it, basically, they came out in seventy eight. By eighty, it already stopped uh, making them. Yeah. And uh, an outfit called Computer Data, co a Compu Data, took it over. <laughs> and then Compu Data did a little bit of manufacturing. Uh, but eventually, this thing went south uh, after all was said and done, and that was the end of the uh, the the uh, Exidy Sorcerer. It's still it's a good looking machine. If you see one set up with the S one hundred expansion, it's a powerful looking display you've got there. It's quite yeah. nice, and they had mon monocro monitors for it, and and, and you could output the t television. Yeah. They that was it. another big thing that he uh, was really ticked about was. He wanted. He didn't want to go pet style with a monitor permanently attached, and he right. didn't want to go TRS eighty style where you had to plug some, uh, something into it. So he took and had RF outs basically. Yeah. So uh, just for just to close the door on this, if you're interested in picking one of these up, uh, they are very rare for something that's allegedly was distributed in the tens of thousands. Yeah, uh, you're, they are going to cost you. To get a working one, just to get one that you know is known working, you're going into the twelve hundred dollar range. Yeah, you can get some that are like, eh, you don't know. I've seen them go for like six hundred, but normally you're looking around eight or nine, and the peripherals that are off the charts yes. expensive. Because I mean, you could have disk drives, you could have yeah. printers, you could have all kinds of stuff plugged into this. The thing. floppy alone is three fifty. The S one hundred I saw going for a hundred bucks. I saw a tape that had a backgammon game on it, just a tape. Not a not a cassette. Go for a hundred and thirty two bucks. Sold for that. That's how expensive it was. Uh, they are super expensive. I saw the keys for the keyboard. One individual key was going for forty bucks. So these things are where you're going to get them. You know. So if you because I, I thought to myself as I always do. Once I investigated this thing, I was like, man, I got to get me one of these eggs, these sorcerers. <laughs> I'm not getting an Exidy Sorcerer. Sorry. You can buy it piece by piece. Yeah. There. It'd be cost. easier to go find an actual Sorcerer <laughs> trying to whip me one up magically. So, with all that said, uh, and it was fun to come down this road. Since I love investigating something that I don't have any idea. Uh, you know, it's funny that the first time I heard about this thing was from Haney, and here we are today. Uh, we, and so we were tasked to play a couple games with it. I will say, I had deep discussions with Spijaka this week of getting this thing running, and, and I got it running pretty easily using an older version of Mess, uh, the main offshoot, and uh, it loads up everything quite nicely, and everything ran quite nicely. And I managed to play a bunch of the games on this thing, but we narrowed it down to two games, Brent. I believe yeah. you wanted to run, start the show this week with your game. So what did you bring to the table, my friend? Aaron, I did a little game called Arrows and Alleys. And before we get into the game proper, there's a few things we have to talk about. All right. And that is who made Arrows and Alleys. Yeah. And that is a, a, a gentleman by the name of 
He's so unknown. Vic Ptolemy. <laughs> okay. Vic Ptolemy. Now, Aaron, do you does that name ring a bell to you at Vic all? Vic Ptolemy. Yeah. No. That is the man who, uh, although started on the Sorcerer, went on to become part of XD's arcade divisions, oh. and is one of the programmers for games like uh, uh, Crossbow, uh, Combat, and he worked on Chiller. And he did an interview about his experience with Chiller when Exidy, Exidy's had that uh, uh, death race, right? right? They put that out, and it got media attention. It was big news about how violent the game was, yeah. right? Yeah. And they wanted to go back to those glory days in huge air quotes there yeah. because they made so much money off all the media attention. Yeah, that's a beautiful cabinet, too. I will say that. So, they, this was, Vix had been in the business for a while, and uh, he came, they came up to his department. They had just did Crossbow and uh, the uh, Western one, which I can't remember Giant. the name. Yeah. And they were like, okay, we want you to use this technology, and we want you to make a game. They are like, okay. You know, they kind of thought that was coming. They said, no, 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 no. We want you to make a game that's so over-the-top and offensive that it will grab media attention again like it did for Death Race. Yeah. And they went, they went at it, right? And they, for those who don't know, Chiller, the opening scene is this torture room, like a literal torture room yeah. with nude peop nude men and women inside of it that you shoot their body parts off. You shoot the bits of the torture device, like the rack, to rip people in half. I mean, it's gruesome, it's even by today's standards. And you, I mean, we've got Mortal Kombat and that kind of crap, right? Yeah. This was... it. Even for today's standard, this is probably over the top. It was gruesome in a tasteless sort of gruesome Oh, way. gosh. It was like a C movie you'd get at Dairy Mart yeah. one night. You know, blood-sucking <laughs> freaks or something. So they kept making the uh, game more violent and more violent. And Vic was saying, like, they never, they never forced them to, go, to take that more step. But they encourage them yeah. to keep taking the steps with Chiller, and like he said that he got so used to the to the graphic violence it actually desensitized him, and he ended up leaving uh, them and went on to Sun Microsystems where he programmed out for the rest of his days. Yeah, but he got his start all the way back on the Sorcerer. That's crazy. And the reason why he got the his start on the Sorcerer is he re uh, reverse engineered the opening sort the opening software when you turn on the game yeah and they took notice that he had done this and they thought they had a leak inside the company so they approached Vic and they were like listen we need to know who leaked this software to you we you know we got to we're trying to find the the culprit so we can fire him you get him in legal trouble and he so he said I, no one leaked it to me i just reverse engineer it Hired him on the spot. They knew they had. They had. They hired. Spot. They hired him on the spot. Probably the same guy that did this did Chiller. Yes, that's baffling to me. He started his first game was called Magic Maze, and then he followed up with Arrows and Alleys. And Aaron Arrows and Alleys, like you alluded to earlier, is uh, based off of Targ, which was an arcade uh, game that was instead of driving around arrows spaceships is kind of what they imply on this. Yeah. You drove around cars. But the concept, the gameplay, everything is absolutely the same. It's all, it's hard to believe that you would take a game from the people that make the computer and clone it for that computer. Why don't they just call it Targ? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, of course, he was hired with the company at this point. Uh, oh, no. You know what? I'm sorry. I take that back. The actual company that distributed this was quality software. Sounds like a name you could trust. <laughs> and quality software did a lot of stuff for the Sorcerer, and they also did stuff for Apple II and stuff like that. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Arrows and Alleys. This is a single-screen game where you control... We're just going to call it a spaceship... It never goes into really deep what the 
what's on the screen, but they kind of look like spaceships. Well, they call it a car, but it, looks, it doesn't it look like, like a car. Or something. Yeah. yeah. So you are tasked to eliminating all of the arrows that are out in this city-like grid. Yeah. Uh, and for the sorcerer's benefit, having that higher resolution allowed them to make like a 12 by 12 grid. It's a huge play area where you can drive around all its perfect rows and columns of lanes that you can drive around on. And you have a gun. You can shoot directly in front of you. You can speed up by tapping the key, whatever direction you're going. Yeah. And once you get to a maximum speed, it will hold that maximum speed, and you can hit the opposite way you're going to slow down. Wow, that explains a lot. What? I don't. I didn't pick up on that game mechanic, but I. I mean, I picked up on the slowing down and going in reverse. But yeah, that's. I, I like now that makes sense to me. Because I, I, I was like, man, I was like, I'm having trouble controlling this thing, and that that explains a lot, right? Yeah. There. So, and you can't like. It moves up, down, left, right. Like you're stuck to the cardinal directions. Yeah. But if you're going right to speed up, you you don't hit up with the, hit the gas. No, you actually keep tapping right. Uh, if you get to uh, the edge of the screen, you will automatically turn your vehicle. Uh, and if you do that, you will slow down. It kind of is sort of a punishment for not going around the corner yourself. When you are uh, in the maze, it's not a maze. It, when you're in the grid, all of your enemies fill up all the columns at the start. Yeah. So you have a full column of enemies, and they start coming down the screen at you. Now, very quickly, as soon as you do anything, maneuver left or right, they kind of break formation, and they have pretty good AI to avoid your shots and try to hit you from the side or the back. Yeah. Mostly from the side. Uh, only way they can hit you from the back is if you actually are going slower. Um, controls are what you think they'd be. They're arrow keys for the sorcerer. That would be the numpad. Yeah. And uh, a space bar to shoot. Every once in a while while you're playing, one of the squares in the grid will pulsate. And that signifies that they are launching a rocket. Now the rocket has the exact same movement of the arrows, your typical enemy, uh -huh. but if you shoot the rocket, you will get bonus points. Pretty standard game. Pretty the standard. arrows seems to do its own thing. I've no, I mean, you know what I'm saying? The rocket? No, the rocket, excuse me. It seems yeah. to like, it sort of uh, acts differently. It does not follow the same yeah. AI as the, as the arrows. It's not nearly as aggressive, um, but it can kill you just the same. Yeah. It's satisfying to shoot them because the, the screen tells you you get bonus. Yeah. That's nice. So, the gameplay of this, of course, when you start the game, you choose one of four difficulties or speed levels. And as the game progresses, of course, it gets harder and faster. So, where this game goes so terribly wrong, the graphics are fine. Everything, you can tell where everything is, what everything's doing. The sounds are beeps and boops, uh, which is fine considering the hardware it's on. The scrolling, the movement, all is good. For a machine of this age, uh, keeping track of all of these different enemies, moving at different speeds, going in different directions, it does really well. There's no slowdown at all. However, in the most crucial point, the most crucial part of this, the control just feels off. And it's very hard to explain. And it's not like you can't, like when you want to turn left, you hold left, you turn left, but it feels just delayed enough, just that little speck of delay that makes it feel wrong, makes it feel sluggish. And it, for a game this fast paced and chaotic, it's very devastating to the gameplay. Uh, I, I tried to, when I was playing it, I was trying to figure out, do I just have to pre-hit the button, right? And, and hold left well before the intersection to go left. And that kind of works, but it still doesn't feel right. And the intersections are so common that you can't really do that you can hold it right before you get there and kind of get a little bump on it, but it feels off. Uh, 
<laughs> the shooting, you can have one bullet on the screen at a time, but you can rapid fire. So if you get a lineup of enemies, you can just hold the button down and you'll shoot them all. If that feels it happens good. so rarely, but when it happens, yes. it's a, it's very satisfying. Yeah, because the AI is programmed in a way that it won't just line up to get slaughtered. It's yeah. it's pretty good. Um, also, and this is probably, you can probably learn to cope with the controls, but the absolute sin of this game is anytime you shoot the rocket or anytime you are in between lives or anytime you advance stages, or any time you get game extensions, if you get a score high enough to get a bonus life after your last life, yeah. the game just just crawls. Everything that it's like, ha ha, you've done this, stays on the screen incredibly too long. It absolutely kills the pacing. I mean, it doesn't. The game doesn't crawl. It just interrupts the game. Yeah, with, that's with what the screen. Yeah, and, and it just sets there, and you're like, okay, I'm hitting a key. I want to go on. What's going on? And the game just punishes you. You hate that. I know that's your pet peeve. It doesn't well, bother me as much. Even when you shoot the 500 in the game, yeah. it's like a five-second affair. Yeah, but it's a, you should be happy. You should be celebratory. I'm point. not celebratory. I want to keep playing. <laughs> uh, it, it made me... I mean, you have to shoot the rocket because it's coming after you, but it's, it's almost a punishment on top of the reward. Uh, when you get an extra life th at the end of the game because you've done so well... That screen is like a 30 second screen. And it's not loading, all of this is already in memory. This was a choice that they made. So you could read the screen. I understand that's what, why it's, the pause is there for. But it's literally like 30 seconds, uh, 20 seconds. It's, it's not ideal. It, it is really idea. bad. Yeah. And that hampering with the controls, just go play Targ. Uh, the arcade version of this is the exact same. Uh, the grid, the grid pattern that you play on might be a little bit smaller, uh, but it's it's so much more fun to play. And what did you think of this game? Well, I didn't. I think I liked this more than you. I played a lot, and one thing I liked about it is is the satisfaction you get about maneuvering the bad guy. Yeah, because they're clever. When it comes to a game like this, that's that's set up with a, with a grid and the little buildings or whatever the squares. Control always feels weird because you're having to make that make those turns real quick, and you always feel like you're anticipating or whatever. So I've always but this like, is one step beyond every one even of these that. I play. I didn't think the control were that bad. It was okay. You know, every when I played this, it's funny because I just mentioned this other with boat. When I played this, I pictured my car like Auto Man's car, where he made, would make this tight curve. If you ever watched the Auto Man show. His car would literally turn without stopping or slowing down at all. That's yeah. what this car is like. It just hits these turns and just keeps right on trucking. And so that made it more fun for me. This game, when you after you get uh, when you start out the game, it's real slow because you got all these arrows coming at you. But as you eliminate them and as you move forward, this game speeds up, and the sorcerer can handle it. Man, it gets yeah. real fast. And when you've got these guys sort of honing in on you, it you, it's hard. It puts your mind in another uh, another zone of play where you have to like think about things in a different way, you know, because that because these things are like heat seeking missiles or something. They're always in pursuit, and so what you've got to do is to outmaneuver them. Yeah, it seems easy. No, it, but it's not. No, it's the not, AI is really it's good. It's not just the AI. It's just the fact that like it's hard to get your brain wrapped around what's happening. You know, uh, the arrow or the missile's a nice touch. I like that when it comes out. I mean, it's just something different. Just mix it up a little bit. This game's fun. We were disappointed because it supports one or two players. And we were both hoping it's a simultaneous two-player, but it's not. No chance. That would have yeah. been cool, though, if, if it had that. But the controls, like I said, it's a, it's a game that once you sit down and fiddle with it, you'll get better at the controls. I don't know how far you got into this game, like how many rounds. But like you could get, it gets pretty, uh, it gets pretty exciting. Let's put it that way. Yeah. As you play into, it. Well, it gets faster for sure. You know, I mean, it's also a high score game. You can yes. play for scores. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, but I mean, I did not come up with like a sound strategy. I, it's the thing is that I know there's someone that can do something to to beat this game with cleverness. Like I, I thought I'm sure. a, I'm on the cusp of a maneuver that will make these guys do something dumb. You know, but I couldn't come up with that maneuver. And to be honest with you, my, my abilities in Targ, I never played it that much, but I mean, I knew of it. 
And I was like, you know, I was like, what is that game? What is the game? Yeah. You know, and then you came up with it. I was like, oh, yeah, that's the game. But uh, uh, this is very similar. But it's the exact same it's game. It's fun. It's okay for a computer it, for 78. Not, not well, bad. Well, this game was released in 80. Yeah. Uh, Just so, under the wire. So it was pretty much <laughs> at the end of the lifespan. Um, but it played the, the, the smoothest and stuff is fine. For games like this, my go-to game is, a, is an arcade game called Solar Fox. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, and, got a, that got a 2600 release, too, didn't it? And it works on that same grid pattern yeah. type thing. Now, it's more of a, a collect game, but it also has shooting elements. And the controls on that are spot on, where this just feels sluggish You can me. see how a game like Rally X or something would, would, could take... This could be like the genesis of an idea like along those lines. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. So, Aaron, you went in a different, although incredibly similar, direction. What did you bring to the table well, this week? Well, you know, I looked over what was available. There was just so little footage of this machine, to be honest with you. Yeah, this was tough to, to pick so a we, game for. We generated our own footage uh, for this one. I looked, you know, it's funny. I actually, once I got the thing working, it didn't take me very long to figure out which one I wanted to do, uh, the brand. And so I picked a game called Astro Attacker. Astro Attacker. Now, Astro Attacker. I managed to find the documentation for Astro Attacker, if you can believe that. And I bring this up because in the very first line in Astro Attacker, it says, Astro Attacker is similar to the arcade game called Astro Blasters. They didn't try to hide it. And by similar, we mean the exact same. Well, it's, well, not, it's, it's exactly, exactly, exactly the same. It, Gameplay-wise, it's the exact same. So I thought we would look and take a quick look at Astro Blast, the arcade game, so you can get some reference here. Astro Blast, sort of a semi-famous game. Oh, yeah. Uh, developed by Gremlin Industries, published by Sega. I think it was out in 1981, I believe. And this was designed by a couple people, Gary Shannon and Barbara... Malach, Malelic. Uh Gary Shannon had a ton of Apple II stuff. The funny thing about him is he his big claim to fame was he worked on a couple of the field and stream games uh, on the on Windows in '99 and 2000, which is oh gosh, <laughs> it was bizarre. Uh, Late into his career, Barb Barb Michalik actually worked on some Amiga games, some Amiga titles, including uh, Hair Raising Havoc, and did uh, Little Mermaid, Ren Stimpy, World Series Baseball, and Desert Demolition on the Genesis, hmm. which is interesting. Uh, Astro Blasters was a pretty popular arcade game back in the day. The, the game, the big claim to fame for this thing was the fact that it used digitized speech. Yeah. You know, that sort of was the big deal in this thing. So it was a game where that was uh, a space shooter that was separated into different stages uh, where you shot different sorts of aliens that came from the top of the screen. And eventually you had to dock with a mother, the mothership. <laughs> you had to dock with the mothership. And this thing would, that was how you'd end the round with docking with the mothership. This is a pretty big deal uh, back in the game. One of the things I found out about this that I didn't know, uh, this was the first video game to have re copyright registered in Japan. Oh. Isn't that it's a weird one? But this game gained so no some notoriety sure. back in the day. So it's uh, And it had, was cloned multiple times on multiple machines, including the Cocoa version that we played quite a bit. Also one of the few games, I saw this, I knew this, and then I saw it mentioned in the wiki, it's one of these games where if you play two players, like, you basically, the players alternate in between rounds. So, yeah. so you can go, like, one guy can lose all of his men before player two plays one single time. And then player two is by himself. I always thought that was funny. So anyway, here comes uh, uh, Astro Attacker, uh, released on the Exidy in 82. So this is a real late, re late release as well. Uh, this is credited to a fellow named David J. Itner who worked on one other game on the Sorcerer called Military Encounter from 81. It was a computer adaptation of the board game Stratego. All right. Yeah. Okay. This game sold for $21.95, and it was published by the Global Software Network. They were responsible probably for the most famous game on the, uh, uh, on the Sorcerer called Chomp, which is a Pac-Man clone. They also published Military Encounter. Uh, and this was released on cassette tape. Now, this had an interesting, some interesting uh, abilities, and you could tell this was a late release because of what they supported. This would support a joystick if you had one really? rigged up. It also supported this thing called the Arrington Music System, which thankfully MES supports as well. 
The Arrington music system was a musical device that was developed by an outfit called, it was developed by Howard Arrington and sold through his company, Arrington Software Service. It was a six-bit DAC that allowed the sorcerer to play four-channel music using special software that plugged into the parallel port. Huh. And you had to hook a couple speakers up to it. So this is the, the sound when you play this game, if you play it in mess and you hear the you know, this is the this is the sound being generated by this uh, this music, the Harrington music system. Hmm. Uh, so uh, the uh, so get this. So Astro Attacker is a bit different than Astro Blaster in several ways. Uh, it is a space shooter where you move your ship along the bottom and shoot up at things at the top. Uh, but it, of course, they had a more limited scope here, but they did a pretty good job, I think, with what they had to offer. Uh, this game is one of these space shooting games where you've got a, a, basically a shield and you've got, or excuse me, you've got fuel and you've got a overheating laser yeah. uh, bar on the side. When you start the game, if you sit there long, long enough in the in the display, the ship will come up and start blowing away its own logo, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> that's cool. That's clever. It was clever, but you, I couldn't find a way to skip it. Well, once so. it starts, they you demand they demand you watch it. By the way, they also <laughs> spell. This is a game that spells the lasers with a Z, which I always you never know. Which you can, I love that. So this game has waves. Okay, different different waves of ships. The very first thing you do in Astro Attacker is pick how many shields you've got. Okay, you can pick one to nine. Uh, I'll just pick nine, frankly. Uh, but uh, the uh, truth of the matter is, uh, it, these shields are not that pivotal in a, in a weird way. Because normally, when you die in this game, you probably just run out of time if you pick a lot of shields. Shields are sort of like just basically how many collisions you can take before you die. So this game starts off with the very first level, and the very first level of this game has you at the bottom of the screen, and you are uh, actually the very first level of this has you docking with the mothership. Yes, the very first thing you do. Now the mothership is a big UFO that appears at the top of the screen, and it's got the initials GSN for the for the uh, publisher cursively written on the side, like graffitoed on the UFO. Well, I think it's supposed to just try to be. Uh, uh, I like it. Uh, like details. Uh, trying to make the letters sort of look like details on the ship, but it's very obvious yeah. that they're initial. So when you when the uh, when you, you you start up on this thing and you actually have to guide your ship to dock with the mothership. Now the first time you dock, it doesn't mean anything. No practice, <laughs> right? Practice. The mothership has three little like points at the bottom, two little ones and like a middle point, and they actually you guide the thing. Into the the big point in the middle, but even the big point you can you cannot get perfectly. Oh yeah, it's tough. It's, it's a cool, tough. it's a good looking UFO. It's a good looking screen. It's a good way to start the game. The next level, you fight these like block looking uh, deals. Uh, the block looking deals are just ships that come across the screen and shoot straight down. They look like fezzes almost. Like you'd wear it like a, at a Shriners convention. Well, they're trapezoids. All right, they look like, to me, they look like fezzes. Okay. <laughs> now, as you, the quicker you shoot these things, the less fuel you use up. So you want to yeah. you shoot them as quickly as you can. But remember, you're, uh, you will overheat your lasers if you don't, uh, if you don't, uh, if you go bananas on them. It's pretty generous, though. You have I to... overheated them tons of times. Oh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm a maniac. If you hold the button, yeah, the the your ship will rapid fire, and yeah. you will overheat that way. But if you press the button, yeah, it's it's pretty forgiving. So I mean, I, I guess you had problems with it. I had absolutely no problems with it. I don't think my heat ever got above half. Yeah. So the uh, mine did uh, tons of times. By the way, the, the instructions name all these things. Let me see. I, I'm not exactly sure what the fezzes are called. I think they're called, um, I think they're called rock, you know, uh, laser ships. So then, the, yeah, these things That's will move. These things sense. just move around above the screen in, a, in generic ways. Okay. Yeah. The next level, these guys come across straight across. These are probably the laser ships. They come straight across and drop long lasers down. Yeah. It's a la Gorf. The, the laser ships in Gorf or the laser ships that come out in Demon Attack, the laser demons, they have those long yes. lasers. And the long lasers linger as they pass by, and so you don't want to hit them. These things come directly across the screen like a chorus line. And if you're quick enough, and I saw Brent do this, 
He picked them off, and he picked them off so quick, you got a bonus for yeah. picking them off. If you kill them all before yeah. they can make it to the other side of the screen, uh, you get a bonus that way. Yeah. It's very difficult because there's at least 18, 20 ships, and while they they all just go from uh, left to right on the screen, yeah. they will come in at different heights. Yeah. So that makes it a little more uh Inter a little interesting that you have to time your shots, and they are shooting down at you, so you can't just say at the stay at the same spot. You have to move. Yeah, and, they, and of course, as you go through this thing, everything gets faster. So the next level, and keep in mind, this is a, a game from '82, so you're getting all these different play elements. The next level are are the rockets. Now the rockets are interesting because they come down diagonally from the top of the screen, yeah, forty five degree angle, and they'll switch sides of the screen. So it's half. The first half come down from left to right. The second half come down right to left. And not only do you have to avoid groups of missiles to try to shoot them, but they also will shoot straight down. Yeah, they're so missiles, the missiles that, that shoot. shoot. <laughs> so this level can be real tricky. And as you move up the ranks, this one gets real, real tricky. Yeah. It's real tough, but it's a challenging. The next level are the spinners. This is another challenging level. The spinners look like um, how how do you know the thing in carnival that you can shoot and spins around? Yeah. that's what they sort of look like. They're just like a, just a, a hole in the middle and two long sticks on either side with little ends on them, they're, and they spin real quick. They look like uh, lawnmower blades. These things move real well. Yeah, in this game, they, they come zip. down. They come down in like formations, and they're it's a real. I mean, all the aliens just move in a real good way. Yeah, I have to say, and this is another one. These things are tough. They shoot real fast, and they're quick. And they'll also come down, and they can stop, and so they can hover right on where your line is. So you can run into them if you're not careful. And then once you've gotten past that, the last level of bad guys you have to deal with are the me is the meteor shower. The meteor shower is just is just ton just like what you think. It's a ton of Little rocks coming down. You've got to avoid them or shoot them and get out of the way of them. And again, as you go through the game, this would become more difficult. At first, it's not so bad on this level. They do go straight down. I yeah. was kind of hoping that they would, some would come down straight and some would go at those 45 degree angles, but they do just go straight down the screen. Yeah. But and, they are numerous. Right. And then, of course, then it's time to dock. And so this is where you need to dock. Uh, it's important because you've been using up fuel. The entire time you've been coming down the screen, and so you and she and shields, and so you need to get up here, and so you have to line this up perfectly. I don't think you can die on this screen, but you can just not get the bonus. Yeah, and that's brutal because if you don't get, if you don't dock with the ship, you don't get the bonus for your the fuel you had left, and you don't get refueled. Yeah, and so that means you've got to go through the entire next round with the same fuel you've got, which is possible. But it's highly Very unlikely difficult. that it's going to yeah. happen. And if your fuel runs out, the game just ends the second the fuel runs out. No matter how many lives you have It just left. says you're out of fuel. That's why the, the lives, like I always hit the lives high, and you will use up lives. And sometimes you just get hit enough that you die. But often you, you're going to die because you run out of, run out of fuel. Uh, you move your ship with the, uh, with the arrow keys. And according to the docks, the four and six key, the space bars used to fire. There's an additional key in this that probably a lot of people didn't even know about. If you hit the tab key, it basically slows the game down. And it, it's sort of like a, 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 long, a long second, like from uh, 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 Max Payne or something, you know, where he, he could do a yeah. thing where it's slow time. And this just slows everything in the game down. And it's handy and dandy if you're getting creamed. Uh, and, and it will it goes for 13 seconds or when you take a hit and then it'll stop which is that's kind of a neat addition uh you can also uh restart the game and you can also pause the game with the various keyboard commands according to documentation the docks name all the ships they give you all the different uh point totals for the ships uh which is kind of neat uh and this thing is uh uh, a nice compact unit. The docks are a, a, were the old uh, photocopied gimmick in a bag, yeah. you know, that came with the tape. So before I get into the reviews and stuff of this, but what did you think of what did you think of this game? Fantastic. Yeah, it's quite good, isn't it? Um, I often say, why why play a computer version of a game when I can just play the arcade game from a modern setting, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, this is one of the rare instances, and I'm always happy to point it out when it happens. Uh, that this improves on the arcade game yeah. uh, by having more stages and more just a variety of stages. 
the action is is more intense i feel i like the size of the enemies versus yeah. the size of your ship more um and that's not to say that Astro Blaster in the arcade is a bad game by no means. Yeah, it's great. But this this does what it's supposed to do. It takes that concept and pulls it just a little bit farther so you get a little more gameplay out of it. The controls on this are tight. Yeah. Uh the the speed that the game not only starts at but ramps up to feels good. The enemies never feel cheap. Uh you will you always see death coming, even though sometimes you can't get out of death's way. Yeah. Uh, the only part of this game, uh, of course, it's black and white, where the, the arcade monochrome. game was... And all the games are monochrome, yeah, yeah. where the arcade game had color. But I, the, the, uh, the images in this are detailed enough that that doesn't bother me. The only place where the arcade game obviously shines in great degree above... Uh, this version is sound. Yeah. So if you can get past that, although the sound is perfectly passable for with the with that gimmick on it, it works. It it's is. Pretty good. Yeah. It is. But I mean, you ain't this thing ain't talking. It no, ain't, no. You know, it's not, it's not doing that that kind of cool gimmick. Um, <clears throat> this is a game that you you set down the first time you play it, you're probably not going to get to the point of docking, uh, yeah. which is fine. Because you're going to play it again, and you're going to start learning. And then you're going to play it again, and then you're going to start going for those shoot-all-the-enemy-real-fast bonuses. And when you get those, it feels incredible. Yeah. Because it, it's it's work. It takes effort. It's not like something—it's not like a Galaga, where the first stage of a uh, bonus stage in that, you have get so ingrained in your head you're going to get it every time. That it, It's not like that, because the enemies are firing, which makes you move— which makes getting that bonus different every time you yeah, play it. Yeah. Uh, the enemy variety is solid. The uh, gameplay elements that, even though it's just shoot up the screen or dock your ship, just having those two elements are enough to keep this interesting. I had fun from beginning to end on this, and it is it is a high score game. Um the only real feel bad moment of the game is if you do miss the docking because yeah, you're bummed. nine times out of ten, that's it. You're yeah. not gonna you're not gonna go through another cycle fast enough. Even in the docks, it says you it's possible to get through another cycle. Yeah. It's almost impossible. Uh the slowdown time thing. Uh the reason why you don't want to abuse it and use it every time chance you get is you're burning extra fuel when that's going on. And that uh, just hurts your chance of making it back to the ship yep. and hurts your bonus points at the other side. It's a neat addition. It's an it really awesome could, addition. You need it. A couple times it really comes in handy. Yes. Especially uh, in the later levels. Uh, there are definitely stages that are harder than others, and yep. that's good. For a game like this, you need to have stages that are harder than others. Uh, you need to be able to breathe every once in a while. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I thoroughly enjoyed I it. Was real, I was real happy and surprised with this. Now, here's a couple tips where we get the reviews on this. So I was nosing around and I kept seeing, I kept, I was searching for just stuff about the game and I kept finding ads in magazines. So like uh, there, I found in PC Magazine from uh, no from October and December of '82, there's a game compilation for for DOS PCs that includes Chomp and Astro Attacker. Now there is, as far as I could tell, no one has recorded footage of this. I haven't found any images of it, and I can't find anyone that owned it, and I can't find any mentions of it anywhere, and it's not listed on, like, Moby or the Wiki or anything. There's no one that says there's a DOS port of this out there somewhere or, uh. a, or a PC booter, but I, I found it over and over, and it's, and when I read the... When you listen... First of all, Chomp was a big exity game. Yeah. So that... And then it says here, the Astro Attacker utilizes the PC's color graphics... Uh, and Astro Attacker is similar to Astro Blaster. So that tells me that either someone cloned the clone or someone did some kind of color port. I found this a couple times, uh, which I thought was interesting. I also, believe it or not, I actually found a review of this game. Magazine uh, review? Oh, no. Magazines. You sucker. No, this is a, this is a fan-made fanzine. It was called <laughs> It was Sorcerer's Apprentice is the name of the magazine. Good name, by the way. It's good. It's Volume good. 4, number 2, March 1st, 1982. 
uh, reviewed by Ralph Laflame. And I'm just going to read a little excerpt here. Uh, Astro Attacker carries on the excellence that we have come to expect of the global software network programs. This $21 program is a takeoff of the popular game Astro Blaster. Mm -hmm. Its detailed graphics and sound rival that of Chomp. And its section, its uh, uh, action, variety, and intensity leave Galaxian behind in the dust. And he goes on to talk about how great a game this is. Uh, I also found a an ad for this. And the very first thing the ad says, Astro Attacker is similar to the game that's called Astro Blaster. <laughs> this action game for the Sorcerer is, is far superior to all other Sorcerer games. Because of its high resolution gra graphics, sound, variety, and playability. So it was hyping this thing to the nine. So there were there were magazines and fanzines for this, and there were people that were reviewing these things. Real quick, I want to point out something yeah. that, that we really we didn't stress enough. Yeah. Uh you was mentioned, but we didn't stress it up. This was released in eighty two. Yeah. 82. Yeah. So this was well past even the lifespan of the system. Yeah, well. <laughs> For what that's worth. I will also say, this would fall in line nicely with a lot of the stuff we played on the TRS-80 Model 1 and 3 or the uh, or the Dick Smith System 80. This game is, and, and this is a game that if you'd released this exact game in the 70s in the arcade, it would have fit Blown right your mind. Yeah. Um, we did get a review, uh, believe it or not, uh, from Pajaco. He writes, I'm relatively new to Astro Blaster as an arcade game, only having discovered it a couple years ago. There is an excellent BBC Micro version of, of this, which we didn't have back in the day. There's also a Coco version. Uh, Astro Attacker is a pretty good attempt to get Astro Blaster at home. And while it isn't an official port, it easily could have been, and people wouldn't have minded. And while it's lacking speech for obvious reasons, the game is still very playable, and the sound effects work perfectly fine. Gameplay-wise, this had me gritting my teeth as the enemies descended, and filling the swear jar when I died. <laughs> and it replicates the whole just being able to miss an enemy by one pixel that the original has. Overall, if you have a Exidy Sorcerer in this game, you'd be pretty happy with it. 8 out of 10. P.S. I'm only starting out on my journey on this machine's library, but so far the machine that came out in 1978 is pretty darn impressive uh, with what it can do in the right hands. So there you go. By the way, you skipped over this, but we might as well read. He also reviewed your game. Okay. So let's get into it. Uh, Pajaco also writes, uh, Errors and Alleys. I feel like I've played this before, but I keep my finger on it. <laughs> okay, I paused it for a bit and had a look through another ARG episode. And yes, this is a similar mechanic to Obliteration Zone on the <laughs> yeah. Memotech MTX 512. Or rather, Obliteration Zone is very similar to this, given that it came out after. So run around a grid and shoot arrows that are kind of chasing after you. I couldn't be sure. And then there is the rocket, which seems to more intelligent. Arrow uh, seems to be a more intelligent arrow. And although it looks simple, you really have to plan ahead, get around, and nail all the arrows. That's true. I'm still on the fence as to whether having acceleration on your car is a good thing or not. Yes, the arrows can move faster as the less of them remain. But sometimes you want to flip around and shoot your pursuer, and you can't. So you end up going around the grid trying to catch up behind them. I think I prefer more the Rally X Pac-Man style of maze maneuvering uh, for this kind of game. Comparing this to its arcade counterpart Targ, I found that the Arrows and Alleys had slightly more eager sprite collision, which meant you could uh, be nailed even when you thought you were clear. Overall, though, Arrows and Alleys is quite fun, but it feels like it's missing something. Good for a quick game or two, but not a game I'd play a lot. In one setting, six and a half out of ten. I think that's very fair. And I think all that is very fair. And I will say, just to close this up, just two things. One, uh, good luck. You're never, ever going to find these for sale. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean I, I looked at what had been available for the XC Sorcerer, uh, like in terms of like on eBay, and there was like one or two things like that have been out for the past eight million years. And secondly, uh, given the ease of use of the XC Sorcerer, and I played games with the basic cartridge without a load of games with the uh, uh, wave files, you know, with like tapes. And it was quite easy to do. It's a real, I mean, it doesn't take hardly anything just to type in three letters 
Uh, this would be a fun system to dig into. Log is what you yeah. need to type in for those that might have gotten this far and are wondering. If you get the Tosek, uh, there's not much in that. I was surprised. So really, there are other pages that you could get more stuff out of. Yeah. Uh, but I, I had a cup of coffee with a bunch of stuff, and it's a mixed bag. I, would, I mean, it's a game. It's a system that came out in 78. So you're going to get some sort of remedial stuff. There's a ton of arcade clones. There's Pac-Man clones and Defender clones and Space Invader clones. All the clones. Uh, but there probably are some hidden gems tucked away in there for the person that's willing to sit down and, and tiptoe through the tulips on that system. But I enjoyed playing the games, and I really enjoyed uh, researching. A lot of fun. You know I love that stuff, the brand. Absolutely. You know what I love, Aaron? Uh, to give me trouble? Well, yes. With the wheel. Oh, let's do it, man. Aaron, what did you add since you added this week? Next week, we added uh, character graphics games from Buck Owens. And we also, as the uh, as the Retro Rewind piece, we added the MSX2. The MSX2. Why, Aaron, did you add that? So I got the MSX2, and I haven't fired it up recently. So oh. I thought this would be a good So you're kind of hoping for it, huh? I mean, I, listen, I like everything. I like the Sorcerer. It's a funny thing. After watching Boat interview Haynes, about it, and here we are years later, and I, it, I still remember that. It's, it, I really enjoy it. I can see why someone would program on it. Absolutely. And here we go. And right, 3D house wheel, eh? All right, and the winner is character graphic games, Aaron. Okay. Character graphic games. What does that mean? Buck Owen. That means that the car the graphics are made with characters and not sprites. Oh, basically boy. what we just played. Okay, so we've got to pick something that has. We'll be going back into the old school, and yeah, it looks like we are stuck in the '70s. Yep. Well, that's okay. And that's okay. I'm perfectly fine with it. Absolutely. Very good. Hey, well, that means any system. Yeah, even if a modern system has sprites but doesn't use them, that's up for that. That counts. Does that's that good. happen? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are, I'm sure it happened, yeah. Hey, uh, that'll be in two weeks, Brent, uh, because next week uh, we're back with R. Sinclair. We're going to play uh, J uh, Jeff Cape's Strong Man. Strong Man. So we're going to get we're going to get our Strong Man on. That'll be a lot of fun. I always enjoy heading back down into the Specky. So that should be a lot of fun. A couple things I want to mention. This week, uh, we've got a, several sticks in the fire, the Brent, uh, with activities and fun things. Uh, right now, we are still in the midst of the Amigo Aaron Pod Jam 2024. Uh, if you're interested in getting a making a podcast uh, to enter the competition uh, to win uh, lovely gift certificates from our good buddy Frank at RichardRewind.ca, uh, you've still got time. You've got till uh, May 1st. To enter the competition, we've already had we had a couple entries in the past week, so they're starting to filter in. If you're interested in joining that, head over to the Discord. All the information's uh, there. Uh, also, uh, coming up in just a couple weeks, April twentieth, uh, we will be doing the International Computer Club. It's back, brother, and we've already got a bunch of people that have signed up to do presentations. Uh, we'll be doing this at four p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, it will be, you can log on to our Discord and uh, join up. Uh, you, there's a sign-up sheet, sign up, get yourself uh, placed on the sign-up sheet, and then you will be able to do your presentation, show your video or whatnot at the International Computer Club. Again, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on April 20th. Yep. So that should be a lot of fun. That's a couple things we've got cooking uh, in the next uh, month or two. Uh, you got anything you want to toss on the fire? Nope. All righty, then. We will catch you guys next week for some strongman action on R. Sinclair. Until then, have a good week, everybody. Sayonara.